glad they could be with us today. All right, let's take our Bibles, if you would please, and go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's, uh, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 3. <coughs> Read uh, verses 14 down to verse 17. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. You know, all Scripture is given by inspiration. It's God-breathed. It's inspired. It's profitable for doctrine. That's, that's teaching. Those are teachings, all right, for reproof, for correction. And notice it says for instruction in righteousness. It's not instruction in anything else. It's instruction in righteousness. And I want to preach today on the Word of God. That is our tool. And you'll notice in, in Ephesians chapter 6 that the, the sword, the, the, the what we have, or it is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. It's the only thing given for our offensive. The rest is all given as a defensive armor uh, in the battle that we face. And you know that our, our theme this year is I am in the Lord's army. And we're trying to get people to be serious now about the time that we have left is short. We know that we're in the last days, everything's pointing to it, but we need to be ready. But we want God, we want the, we want the Lord to come back and find us so doing and, and be faithful over those things. And uh, we're going to talk about the Word of God today, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day, thank you for your Word, God, that we have such a, a, a treasure your perfect words that were given to us, that were inspired, Lord, that were preserved for us today. Thank you for the how powerful and how awesome you really are. I pray now that you would take this time, that you'd use it, Lord. I pray you'd help me, use me today, Lord, and that I may not be heard, Father, but you would be heard through your word today. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We live in days where God's Word has become a take-it-or-leave-it type of theology with, among uh, both lost and many professing saints of God. You know, how convenient. Just take what you want from the Word and then leave what you don't like behind. That's not how it is. That's not how it's supposed to be. The Bible is not a buffet. It is to be taken whole. All right, you don't, when you're taking, anybody in here take vitamins? Take vitamin one a day or twice a day or eight a day, <laughs> whatever it might be. Well, you know, vitamins are not known for tasting great, are they? They're kind of nasty, as a matter of fact. I've had to, I mean, I'm getting up and I'm starting to get older now. I've been taking vitamins too. Try to help myself a little bit in that arena. But those are nasty. They're a big horse pill and it's nasty. But you know what? I can't just take what I want out of that vitamin and, you know, just take, uh, take it all out of that little pill and leave off what I don't want. I have to take the whole pill and my body will break it down and use it how it, it, how it is. You realize that you can't just do that with the Bible either. You can't just take what you want out of it and leave what you may not like 
and, and, and leave that behind. We can't do that. You take it in as a, the whole Word of God and let the Holy Spirit break it down inside of us and, and then use it where, it's, where, where we need it the most. The doctrine of the Word of God is the most important of all doctrines because it is in this King James Bible that we find the basis for every doctrine that we have. And it's leading us, and we said that, that, it's, that it's for the doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's right living. It's going to tell us and teach us and show us and guide us into righteousness. Okay? So no wonder the Bible says if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We have to maintain those foundations. There's no room for compromise when it comes to the doctrines of inspiration and preservation and purity and authority of the Bible. That's just what it is. We have to stand on what it is. The Bible stands. We sing that a lot here. Uh, and, and, and it's true. The Bible stands alone. It is something that's always been and always will be. It will never be destroyed. It will never pass away. It will never be gone. It will always be, and it will always be the truth. Amen. That's why we rest. That's why it is profitable. If it wasn't true, how could it be profitable for anything? How can a lie be profitable for doctrine? Or reproof, or correction, or instruction. It can't be. And it's because that it is the truth that is given from God. It is literally the words of God. When, when Jesus said back in Matthew, He said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That then right there made God responsible to give us a book with every word in it that we would live by. And He did. He did. The Bible is an inspired book. In verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, in righteousness. Literally, it means God breathed every word from heaven. Amen. The same life, eternal life-giving breath that breathed into the nostrils of man, the breath of life, and man became a living soul forever. He breathed His Word from heaven, and that life, eternal life-giving breath is breathed into this book. This book is alive. Yeah. It's alive. It's not a dead book. It's a living book. It is alive. 2 Peter 1.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Right. You think, well, how did they speak? They wrote it. Do you realize that writing is a form of speaking? It's speaking. You're putting your words on paper. Instead of just speaking them out of your mouth, they're written down. And those words are preserved. Those words go forth. That is how we came to have the written word of God was that holy men spake as they were moved to write every word breathed from God's mouth from heaven and pen exactly everything as God would have it. You can't tell me that, uh, that David would want to write down all the bad sins that he had for everybody to know that ever would be. You know, I mean... Hey, hey, you know, God you know, God doesn't just come to David and say, hey, whatever you feel like, you know, doing a contribution to this book that's going to be for the whole world, just, just go ahead and throw that stuff in there for me. Oh, let's see. Let me write every wicked, horrible, and abominable thing that I did. He's not going to do that. He was compelled by the Holy Ghost of God to write down every right. word that was breathed from God's mouth. God told all that. Amen. God made him write all that. 
And so we, by nature, we want to make ourselves look good. We were not going to buy, we would not be the type to write down all these wicked and terrible things that that that, that we do and, and put it for everybody to see. We wouldn't do that. So you know God, God had a design in that. The Bible is a pure book. In Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield of them that put their trust in Him. All right? The Bible is a settled book. Psalm 119, 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen. You, you know, you can believe it or not believe it. It doesn't, it doesn't make it not settled. It doesn't make it not true. It does not shake either God's promise or my confidence in His Word, whether you believe it or not. You will believe it one day or another. But it's way better to believe it on this side. If you believe it while you're here, that means you, you're going to be set for eternity in a great and wonderful place. You will come to believe every word of God whether you believe it on this side or not. Because it's not going to change the fact that every person will stand before God and give an account. You will see God face to face one day. So you can believe it now or you'll believe it later. But if you believe it later, there's no hope for you. We have this life to get it right. We have this short life to, 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 to get what we need from the Lord and believe. And He's given us those words. He's given us the accounts. He's given us everything we need in the Word of God to believe that He is a God. And, and that Jesus is the only way to be saved. It doesn't matter what man says. It doesn't matter what religions teach. Religions are damnable. Everybody likes to take something and make it what they want to do it. Anybody, you can take anything out of the Bible and go off into left field and make your own make your own religion about it. But you can't even have true religion if you can't bridle your tongue. And the Bible tells us that plainly. If a man among you seem to be religious, if that yet yeah, not that man bridle his tongue, that man's religion is vain. You can't even be religious if you can't control your mouth. Amen. So there's a lot of people that claim to be religious that aren't. It's vanity. It's not real. We don't push religion here. Yeah, we're Baptist. It's on the door. It's on the sign. Because we believe that, that the Baptists teach, but you, you also notice something. It doesn't just say Baptist out there. It says fun, independent fundamental Baptist. That, so we have to be independent from the Baptists. It used to be just a group that were the Baptists, but now they start going the wrong way. You've got your associate, you're locked in with the, the rest of them. It's like a guilty by association thing. So being an independent fundamental Baptist, we can stay true to what we know to be the Word of God and not, not be associated with those that are drifting away from the Word of God as such are doing so right now. And so it is God's Word. It's not religion that matters. It's not personal feelings that matter. You know, God's Word is true whether you like it or not. It doesn't change the truth. Right. You can believe all you want to that the walls are blood red. All Does that change the color of the brick? It sure don't. I'm going to be having that white brick staring me right in the face. The only thing that the only thing that I'm doing is presenting myself to be not right in the head. <laughs> because I pronounce that these walls are now deemed red. And believe it, that don't change a thing. The only thing that's going to change you and I is believing the truth. Yeah. Amen. And the word of God is the truth. It just is. That's what we push here. We push the Word of God. The Bible is a settled book. It's a magnified book. In Psalm 138, 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Amen. 
the Bible is both true and it works. Here are some reasons uh, that it is so rejected. I want you to understand why people reject the Bible. Because that's the biggest thing. The, the, one of the biggest confrontations that you might have or the biggest argument against what you're trying to do with witnessing to people will be the Bible. And that's what it's going to be. We, we want to understand what, why it's so rejected. Well, here it is. I'll, I'll give it to you. First of all, it's rejected because God's Word confounds the wicked. We already know they can't understand it. The natural man receiveth not the things of God, neither can he, because they're spiritually discerned, right? But in 1 Corinthians 2.14, that, 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 that's, that's the verse that I'm talking about. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto them, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And it confounds people. And what happens when somebody doesn't understand something? When they don't understand something, or it's not something that, they, that they're, they're getting, what is the first thing that they do? They attack it. They attack it because they don't understand it. They want to try to snuff it out. They, they, I can't wrap my mind around it, so I'm going to try to destroy it. That's the way. That's the mentality of people. Whenever you get them involved in a situation where they they just don't understand it, they they want to lash out at it. They want to they want to try to they want to try to especially when it confounds them. See, the Bible is not confusion. Okay, God is not the author of confusion. Right. If there is confusion, it does not come from God. All right, and we know that there's plenty of that out there. That comes from the devil. God made it perfectly clear, this is my word, he says. This is my word shall never pass away. Okay, it's God's word. And he gave it from heaven to every person on the planet. No matter what religion they claim to be. No matter what it is. Because the truth has shown to all men. You know how the sun rises and sets? The sun rises on the just and the unjust. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. A lot of people like to, like to try to say God's mean and this and that. And, well, why does God allow all these terrible things to happen? Why does He do that? Well, you know what? He gave us a free will. But there's, there's more to it. He also wants us to know, and, and if you haven't figured this out growing up, there are consequences to your actions. Right. If you have the right kind of parents anyway, there's consequences to your actions. When you do something wrong, you find out real quick that it wasn't something you should do. The same is true with, with all of life and with, and with God as well. For those of us who are saved, when we do wrong, we get in trouble for it. We have to give an account for that. We get chastised for that. Alright? God's Word confounds the wicked. It convicts the sinner. Hebrews 4.12 For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of the sunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It gets right down to where you and I are. You know, I've always said this, that the truth hurts because you're not lined up with it. Otherwise, the truth is a pleasant thing. God, God's Word is the most Wonderful and joyous and instructive to you when you're lined up with it. When you're not lined up with it, it really is painful. It's just painful. I've been on the receiving end of that painful and not been right with God. We all have. We're human beings. You're gonna you're gonna be in that situation. Right? We always get ourselves into that situation. But it's a painful thing. There's been times where I just didn't, uh, when I wasn't right with God in my life, I didn't want to hear the preaching of the Word because I knew it was going to talk to me about why I was not right with God. <laughs> and it was going to convict me about and make me feel bad about not being right with God. 
And, and that the, the Spirit of God was going to draw me and say, hey, you know what? Let's get this taken care of. Let's deal with this. Let's get this out of your life. Let's re make your deal. You, know, you, you already feel bad about it, so what? you're already right there. You're on the doorstep of having it just gone. Let's take it the rest of the way. Yeah, okay, you feel bad about it. Feeling bad about it's not enough. You got to confess it. You got to forsake it. You got to get forgiveness for that thing, and then the, the the communication lines between you and God will reopen because sin closes that off. In Isaiah chapter fifty nine, verse one and two, "Go, the Lord's way hand is not short that it cannot save; neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquity is separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you, and He will not hear." Sin, and that was written in context to Christian people. Sin creates a barrier between us and God that He will not hear. I don't know about you, but I need God to hear me. Mm -hmm. I do. I need Him. And so do you, whether you know it or not. Thirdly, the Word of God converts the seeker. 1 Peter Chapter 123, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's, it's a new beginning. It's a new man. It's renewing the image of God in us and going through the process to where we can once again show forth the image of of God to a lost and dying world. In John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say to you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath ever everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. It will, it will convert you. There's a change that happens there. The change is that you go from being uh, out, an outcast and not able to fellowship with God. You're now changed. You are converted over. You are born again into the family of God. And now you can have communication. Now you can be reconciled to God. Now you're part of the family of God. Now you're able to, to live that Christian life. See, no one can live the Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. Right, right. You can't do it. Well, that's a lot of people I've heard when I, I'm trying to witness to somebody. I'll, oh, I'd, I'd like to be a Christian. Man, I just can't live the life. I can't do it. I said, you're right. You can't. On your own. Mm -hmm. You certainly can't. Neither could I. But with the Holy Spirit inside you that God gives to every person to seal you, to guide you, to lead you to the truth, he strengthens you. He'll, he'll, he'll help you to be able to live the life that you need to live in Christ. See, we can't do it on our own. Jesus said, without me, He can do nothing. Can't do anything. You can't live the life if you don't have Him help. His help. But by, the, by His help, we can do anything. All things. We can do anything. Fourthly, God's word cleanses the saint. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, 27. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. Psalm 119, 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto uh, according to to thy word. John 15, 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. We can be cleansed by the word of God. Alright? We can, it's the washing of the water by the word that we can cleanse our way. We can, uh, according to the word of God that he has given us, we can be clean. We can have a clean slate. We can be forgiven. We can have anything we've ever done wiped away and, and cleansed in the blood of Christ who, who died for every one of us. God's Word calms the fearful. 
Boy, isn't that nice. Are you afraid today? If you are, the Word of God can call those fears. They can. There's no need to be afraid. He's already told you what's coming. It gives us hope. It gives us courage. It, can, it helps us see it through. Isaiah 48, 18. Oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. If you would have hearkened to the commandments of God, then peace would have been just like a river, and your righteousness as the waves of the sea. There's a lot of benefits to obeying the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must do that. And in Psalm 119, 49, remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. Those things call the fearful. God's word comforts the bereaved. Those who have lost. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were, though he were dead, yet shall he live. There's comfort even in the loss of a loved one. If you're saved, if they know Jesus, they'll be in heaven. If you're saved and you know Jesus, you'll be in heaven too. You're going to be together forever. Okay? The sad part is when that doesn't happen. When one goes and the other's not. That's the sad part. That's where we don't have the comfort that we need to have. But we can't see somebody's heart. We don't know. We should not just assume because we don't know. God always tries to put someone in their path to give them the Word of God to tell them how to be saved. Some people may do that and just not be really open to telling other people about it just yet. So... We can't just assume we don't know where they were in their childhood. Maybe they got saved as a child, grew up and got straight away and, and, and gone another way. And their testimony is shot, but their soul is not. Amen? So don't, don't get too uh, upset just then, but we need to do all we can to reach those for Christ. 1 Thessalonians uh, 418, wherefore comfort one another with these words. God's word condemns the rejecter. And that's the last point I'm going to bring to you this evening, this evening or this morning. John 336, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Revelation 20, 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Hey, hell is real. Heaven is real. Thank God. But you know something? Hell is real too. And it's going to take as many as it will as will come. The Bible talks about hell hath enlarged itself. It can grow to accommodate the people that, that are going. If there's no max hell, max occupancy, so many numbers. No, that doesn't happen. It enlarges itself to make room. But you know what? So does heaven. <laughs> So does heaven. There's no, thank God, there's no uh, number capacity in heaven. Only this many people can we fit. I always used to see that. Everywhere you go, you know, you, uh, summertime and you go to a pool. It used to be uh, at, at the apartment complex over in Southgate when we first moved down there. And that was one of the first things I, I, I noticed when I went to the pool in the summertime was that uh, that sign that was there, you know, right after the no lifeguard and <laughs> good luck uh, sign. <laughs> you have the occupancy. Oh, you know, max occupancy. I think it was like 120 or something like that, whatever it whatever <laughs> was. I'm so glad that's <clears throat> the gate of heaven. Amen. 
Now, I wish that sign was on the gates of hell. That there could only be so many that could fit and that we would have a chance to save more. I really wish that that sign were there. That it wasn't moved beneath us to meet, meet them at their coming. That it wasn't enlarging itself to gather more and more and more and more. Every tick of the clock, somebody somewhere in the world dies and split hell wide open. A lot of people have went to hell since I've been preaching this morning. Since we've been here this morning enjoying the service, enjoying the presence of God, people are out there dying, dying, and going to hell. What are we going to do about it? need to take the word out to them. <clears throat> Let them see. Leave tracks everywhere. Go out there and get those tracks. Leave them everywhere. And you know, and you never know what the what the power of that will do. Uh, we when we traveled all over, I would leave them in the restaurant. I even handed it to a guy one time. <laughs> I slipped it under the stall. Amen. <laughs> Some good reading. I put my hand in there. I said, oh, you might be looking for something to read. This will tell you how you can go to heaven. <laughs> he thanked me for it. Thanks. And I heard, I heard the page. I heard it already open. I don't know if that guy got saved on the can or not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to God he does. <laughs> I hope I walk in gates of heaven and some guy comes running up to me to hug me and says, bless God, I was on the toilet when you gave me a gospel track and told me about Jesus. What a day that will be, amen. I'd be just fine with that. You think, oh, that's through. <clears throat> Leave them. Give them. Most people say thank you. You wouldn't even think about that, but they do. Even if they're in the can. They say thank you. So don't get this pre pre you know disposition in your mind and oh well, you know, uh, the, the, you're, you get this preconception that not no one's gonna really be receptive. So you have to be all shy and and, and uh, no, walk up and hand on the track, say, hey, you know what, would you like to hear some good news? All the junk going on. You can have everything you've ever done erased in the sight of God. This will tell you how you can go know you can be in heaven when you die. You don't care about religion. You don't care to talk about it. It's not about anything. It's not about... The only, the only thing that matters is what God says. Here's what He says. Take it. Read it. Consider doing something about it. And if you have a minute... I could take you, I could take a couple minutes and just walk you through that track together and let you see. If they don't have that time, that's fine. I don't have to be here. Please, please just take a, a moment and read it. It's so important. It's the most important thing you'll ever see. Is right here what God has to say about you. We need to be more active. We need to be more active. We need desperately need time is running out so quickly. I can't hardly believe how fast time is going. Mm -hmm. We don't have love, and I believe we'll be seeing Jesus and our love will be very, very soon. Amen. Very soon. You can feel it in the air. Yep. Yeah, that's right, Brother Rich. We rapture practice. Amen. <laughs> no rapture practice. <clears throat> <laughs> what a great day to have come to know Jesus. Amen. What a great day. Let's bow our heads on the man. Brother Forrester, come. He's going to take care of the invitation for us today. I don't know what might be on your heart.